to, to do the recording. You are recording, good. Yes, it is recording. And I'm going to share the screen. Start the broadcast. And it should be on. Can you see my screen? We'll be seeing you do the practical in the lab. You mean the kiwi fruit practical? Definitely not. Because actually, I'm not in the lab, I'm at home. But then you see, this is a practical that I have done at home. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And you can do this practical at home as, uh, uh, as well. All you need is a kiwi fruit or banana or strawberry or whatever. And some washing up liquid, some salt and rubbing alcohol or high proof uh, vodka or something like that. Oh, that's a good question whether you need to check. Uh, please, uh, can you mute uh, yourself? Um, I don't think you need to check at four o'clock to, to check in, but please check in and register your attendance on Moodle uh, now. That would be very good. I just had a meeting uh, where we discussed all the attendance. Uh, exactly. I don't think you need to do it twice. There's two separate blocks, three to four and 45. Jesus Christ almighty, don't they have anything better to do than do to? Okay, then I will, I will remind you guys. Two separate blocks. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, yeah. And people say the Germans have invented bureaucracy. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I've, I've, I've just got the message, Paris, uh, that uh, it has to be. But I will remind you if I don't forget. So please remind me that I remind you. Right, so what are we going to do? I mean, a two hour session, this is, I would think that is against the Geneva Convention uh, of Human Welfare. Are you gonna re-record the last two weeks? Uh, why am I going to, wh wh why, why do you want me to re-record the last two weeks? Is it only audio on Moodle? I mean, luckily I've got the, the, the recording saved. Uh, obviously we'll need to, uh, to check that, but uh, I have the recordings. Is it really two hours? Well, we I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it shorter, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. I will need to check what's going on on Teams. Luckily, I've got the, the, the things all downloaded. Uh, if there is a problem, then it's probably something, uh, an issue with uh, Panopto, I guess. 
Well, okay, so let's get started. Um, and uh, let's have a little bit of fun. What I'm going to do is I want to break it down. I want to uh, start off with uh, doing a little bit more on RNA and do a little bit of recap. Uh, I then want to quickly whiz through the uh, DNA uh, extraction practical. DNA extraction. And lastly, I want to discuss with you how we can analyze DNA, analyze or in general, analyze nucleic acids, nucleic acids. And I will do that uh, in three blocks and uh, between the blocks, then we will have a short uh, break, if that's OK with you. OK, so last week we talked about RNA and the difference between uh, DNA and we said uh, with RNA we have the OH group in position at the 2 prime C position and um, this makes RNA far less stable because DNA remember we have an H group in the two prime uh, position of the sugar. And that makes DNA far more stable. Also, RNA is usually indicated as a single strand, and I write that as an SS, whereas DNA is usually as a double strand. So DS for double strand. And of course, in RNA, we have a uracil, and in DNA, we have a thymine. And in terms of the sugars, this OH in the two prime position that is attached to a ribose, whereas in the DNA, this is attached to a deoxyribose. Deoxy ribose. Okay. Uh, we discussed that RNA, we have basically two forms. We uh, said we have coding, coding RNA. This is the RNA that then is translated into a protein. So translated, translated to protein. And this is predominantly, um, this is predominantly called messenger RNA. And we also have before the messenger RNA, this is the heteronuclear. Uh, which is abbreviated as HN RNA. So heteronuclear RNA. And uh, this is what uh, we discussed. mRNA is uh, single stranded. We also have the non coding RNA non-coding RNA. And this is RNA that is not translated into a, a protein. And I told you one of the typical things is um, the tRNA, which looks like this clover leaf form. Oops, that was that was not right. This one here. I want this to be like this. And what we see, uh, this is a, a typical example where we have a lot of secondary structure. And this secondary structure 
this is when the single stranded RNA can basically pair with itself. So single strand RNA pairs or undergoes base pairing with itself. And what you'd get then is this very complicated and uh, intricate pattern of DNA. This is also called, when it forms this pattern, this is called secondary structure. Secondary structure in the RNA. And very often, or I would say almost always, RNA is on paper is a single strand, but it 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 almost always has this secondary structure where you find base pairs coming together and and binding, uh, which is almost sort of inevitable. Secondary structure is always there in 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 RNA molecules. So we talked about the tRNA which transports amino acids, which are located at this end here, and I abbreviate that with AA, amino acids, that transports it to another complex that contains a lot of RNA, and that is the ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA, or abbreviated as rRNA, uh, the rRNA is uh, an essential part of ribosomes, and uh, the ribosomes are the, uh, is an incredibly complex machinery that produces proteins, as you will uh, do in a different module. So we have tRNA, we have rRNA, we have also other particles contain RNA. So, for example, you will find RNA molecules in uh, something that is called SRP. Uh, have you done SRP in BI302? Okay, what does SRP stand for? Yep, it's the signal recognition particle. And uh, again, that contains RNA. That basically grabs a signal sequence uh, from when uh, the protein is made, when a, se a secretory protein is made at um, a ribosome. And the SRP comes along and uh, then recognizes the signal sequence and directs the whole complex to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum where the SRP interacts with its receptor. Can you remember what the receptor is known as? The receptor for SRP? No. SRP receptor, mm, no, has a special name. No. Translocator, no. It's actually called DP, which stands for docking protein. Docking protein which sits on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and is the receptor for SRP. I absolutely love SRP and the docking protein because that was part of my uh, PhD work. I worked with them and I really loved them. 
oh, of course you should know that. Everybody, everything you should know. So absolutely, there is RNA in SRP. In the in in the SRP, yeah. And um, RNA can also have catalytic function. Uh, RNA can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And one thing that RNA can do is um, some RNA molecules, RNA can modify, modify transcription and translation. can modify transcription and translation. These are usually small RNA molecules, small RNA molecules that do that. So a small RNA, they are very often referred to as micro RNA. And micro RNAs are single stranded, RNA molecules, which are about mm, 20 to 40 bases long. They can bind, bind to mRNA, and they are produced by the, by the cell They are produced by the cell. Yes, SRP binds to the docking protein. That's right. The signal recognition particle binds to the docking protein. Uh, if the signal uh, recognition particle has grabbed a ribosome with a signal sequence. That's basically in a nutshell. So the microRNA can bind to mRNA and can block translation of the mRNA. And it seems that uh, in cancer, um, some of the microRNAs are sort of not regulated properly. So the cell produces these microRNAs, but things go a little bit uh, not right. And therefore, uh, proteins are not produced or not uh, produced in enough uh, uh, amounts or something like that. So that's microRNAs. We also have a similar thing that is called siRNA. And that is, uh, I would call it a shit hot topic. siRNAs are similar things. They are called silencing or small interfering, interfering RNA molecules. They are also uh, small molecules, but they are usually double-stranded RNA. Also about 20 to about 40 base pairs in this case, because they are double-stranded. And what they can do is they can uh, bind, again, they bind to mRNA, bind to mRNA or other RNA. And the RNA, the mRNA then will be destroyed. Will be destroyed. And it seems that this is a very, very old and ancient, uh, evolutionary ancient system, uh, which has been conserved basically from whatever organism uh, we, 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 we look at. Um, people believe that this has been originally um, developed by bacteria as a defense mechanism against uh, bacteriophages, against viruses. 
because the virus enters the cell, produces an RNA strand, and SI RNAs, together with uh, protein complexes, then have the ability to destroy, actually, this foreign mRNA. They are very sequence specific. And uh, currently, there are some uh, clinical trials uh, underway where uh, researchers are going to use SI RNAs, small interfering RNAs, the treatment for the treatment of HIV. Uh, so you uh, add some of these small RNA molecules into the right cells, and there it activates a, a complex, which is called the uh, RNA-induced silencing complex, which then destroys uh, HIV RNA. And I think that is really, really interesting. We also have a similar thing where we are talking about gRNA, that's the guide RNA. Again, these are very short fragments, pretty much similar to SI RNAs. I should say similar. SI RNA. Um, these guide RNAs are part of a complex, again, another protein complex, which is called CRISPR Cas9. Uh, some people Uh, have heard about CRISPR-Cas9, and this is the next big, big, really interesting thing, because that uh, is uh, uh, sort of allows modification of DNA, DNA modification, uh, which uses RNA strands uses RNA, these small gRNA strands. So the small RNA pieces basically direct uh, this CRISPR-Cas9 complex binds to this CRISPR-Cas9 complex. This CRISPR-Cas9 then scans the, the DNA for a similar sequence that matches the guide RNA and cuts the DNA there. And that is currently in clinical trial uh, for some genetic diseases. So that is really, really very, very hot. And if you followed the, the news, the people who uh, discovered CRISPR-Cas9, uh, two uh, ladies, uh, two female researchers, got this year's Nobel Prize for medicine for their discovery of CRISPR-Cas9. And this is going to be an absolute revolution. So it's absolutely fantastic. That uh, yes, there, there, there was something in the press about uh, people playing with CRISPR to do gene modification, and I think it opens a whole can of worms. But uh, I just wanted to illustrate to you that RNA molecules have a lot uh, of functions. Of course, we also have viruses, which can have RNA. So we can have RNA viruses. Um, what is the most famous uh, example for an RNA virus?
Fernando, you scare me. HIV? HIV? Nah. TB? No, that's, uh, that's not a virus. Corona, exactly, COVID. COVID is actually COVID-19 is a typical RNA virus where the genome of the virus is not DNA, it is RNA. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, that is COVID. And I guess if you haven't heard of COVID-19, then um, I'm not entirely sure um, if I should tell you. So COVID, coronavirus um, is an uh, RNA virus. And I like your idea about the SI RNA. And in theory, yes, we should be able to use uh, SI RNAs against COVID, but the technology is not there yet. So these are the viruses. We also can have particles that are smaller than viruses. COVID is actually a really large uh, virus. It has a genome of 3KB that stands for around 3,000 bases, which is really big. But we can also have uh, infectious particles that are smaller, much smaller, and that also contain RNA. No, it's not kilobytes. In this case, it is kilobases. Infectious particles, uh, and these are uh, sometimes referred, and we don't know a lot about them. They are called viroids. And they are really funny things because they are actually circular. Circular RNA molecules with a lot of secondary structure. Secondary structure. And and uh, these viroids can infect plants. Oops. They are plant pathogens. They are pretty small, only 200 to 400 bases long. And they don't code for a protein. These virids are, don't contain uh, any proteins. They seem to interfere with plant metabolism somehow but we need to understand far more about them. I just thought I mention it uh, because I think this is really interesting. So where do all these uh, things come from? Why is RNA such an important molecule? Well, there is some evidence. There is some evidence that the first life on Earth was actually not um, based on DNA, 
we will some a lot of hmm, science some scientists believe that the first life first life on earth was actually based on rna And only later then, when there was a evolution of life, this RNA world, people speak of an RNA world, moved on to more stable DNA, because we know that DNA is more stable. So that is really where we think that, why we think that lots of RNA is still around and has a lot of different functions. It can be uh, regulatory, it can be protection, it can be something that is related to uh, uh, production of proteins. Uh, it has enzymatic function, so RNA is incredibly versatile. So what if DNA came first and because it's stable, RNA came uh, along? Well, actually, we don't know, but it looks like that um, RNA really... <sighs> Another piece of evidence is that you can easily create RNA molecules or the compounds for RNA, whereas it's more difficult to produce DNA compounds. So that's all about what I wanted to say about RNA. I'm fully aware that uh, these things are not on Moodle. Um, um, I thought this is something that is really interesting, and I particularly like viroids. I love them um, because that was my first summer job at university, uh, working with viroids when I did my degree. Uh, working with RNA is an absolute nightmare. Uh, because it is so, so unstable that you have to be so, so careful. My job was to isolate some viroids, uh, viroids that uh, totally uh, obliterate obliterated uh, coconut plants. Um, and you had to be absolutely sterile when uh, working with virus. And I remember one day I, uh, I isolated a whole batch and then my supervisor came to me and said, uh, Peter, I think we have got a problem. I said, uh, what, what, what is the problem? And she said to me, um, what is this dead spider doing in your virus uh, sample? So probably the sample was not sterile. Sterile as in everything had to be totally sterilized. Had to be totally sterilized. We had to make sure that the RNA does not decay and we had to avoid one enzyme. This enzyme is the bane of everybody working with RNA. This enzyme is called RNAs. And I probably shouldn't uh, draw it like that. That looks really nice. I should draw it like, like that. Uh, I see RNAs, that is the enzyme, as the destroyer of worlds. You just have to have one molecule of RNAs hanging around somewhere and it will destroy your RNA sample.
we had a rule when I was working then uh, with RNA um, in my master's uh, project, when I was working with RNA, uh, if somebody had uh, a cold or something like that, they were, they had to go in self-isolation because imagine um, in the labs, at one end of the lab, somebody sneezing, and at the other end of the lab, somebody working with RNA, it would destroy their RNA sample. So that's uh, my enemy, uh, my declared enemy is RNAs. I hate it. Absolutely, yes. Let's use RNAs. Uh, against COVID, but unfortunately COVID has a protection. It has this coat and the spikes that protects it from our RNAs. At that point, I want to have a quick break, a five minute break, uh, and then move on to the um, kiwi fruit uh, extraction. Okay, so back in five minutes. RNAs just simply totally obliterates any RNA molecule. It destroys it, it hydrolyzes it, and the RNA is, I think the technical term is uh, uh, fluffed, uh, destroyed. Um, well, if the RNA is actually exposed, then RNAs will destroy it. There's no other way. I don't have a favorite enzyme. I just have enzymes that I hate, like RNAs. Yeah. Oh, mayonnaise. I like mayonnaise. I'm not getting involved in these uh, in these yes or no or or things like that. But I can tell you that my daughter likes pineapple on pizza.
Right. Shall we go over to the kiwi fruit uh, extraction practical? And I've set up a website for that. Um, you are hopefully all had a look at uh, this practical because, um, well, this practical basically was about two experiments that you were supposed to do in the lab, but of course we can't do that because of our friend COVID. The first part of the practical Part one was extraction of DNA, extraction from kiwi fruit, kiwi fruit, and what you did, what you would have done is take a kiwi, smash it up kiwi fruit, I should say, smash it up. So mash plus you add washing up liquid. Washing up liquid. Plus salt. Plus ice cold uh, alcohol, and you can isolate uh, the uh, DNA from the kiwi fruit. Let's just simply go through what's happening. Why do you use the washing up liquid? This is cruel. Exactly. It uh, disrupts the cell membrane. Disrupts the cell membrane. So more DNA can get out of the cell. Absolutely right. It is, it acts as a detergent. Absolutely right. What do you use the salt for? Absolutely, it neutralizes, neutralizes the negative charges, charges on the DNA, especially phosphates, because phosphates are negatively charged, and it leads then to the clumping, clump of the DNA molecule. And what do you use the ice cold ethanol for? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely right. It makes the DNA less polar. It's the solvent, and in ethanol, in the solvent, solvent ethanol, DNA is not soluble. It's not soluble. So the DNA will not be soluble in the DNA, 
the DNA will not be soluble in the ethanol. And therefore, it forms large clumps. When you look at this mixture that you do with the, with the kiwi fruit, so you have your kiwi fruit mixture, and then you have a layer of ethanol. And ethanol is lighter than uh, water. So here that's the kiwi fruit extract. It's not KFC, if it's K KFE, kiwi fruit extract. What you find is that your DNA becomes insoluble at the border between the water, the fruit extract, and the ethanol. And it's a sort of a gloopy, clumpy, stringy, jelly thingy bit. And that is actually your RNA. So please watch the video uh, where the lady uh, shows you how to extract it. So that was part one. Part two, I think was quite interesting because you also um, you also used some provided uh, DNA. In this case, you prov you were provided with fish sperm DNA. Um, and uh, that's uh, not uh, uh, horrible. Um, it is a very rich source of DNA. And um, when you, for example, have watched films about uh, salmons, uh, that uh, swim up the rivers to lay eggs, at that time, where you, you have thousands and thousands of uh, salmons that are mating, and they, it's usually salmon. No, it's not caviar, it's uh, uh, salmon, as I said. Um, the way it works is the female lays the egg, and the male then releases uh, a huge number of sperms in the hope that uh, one sperm will find an egg and uh, fertilizes the eggs. Time when these uh, salmon are basically mating, the, the, the water is probably as much water as it is fish sperm DNA. So it's a really almost pure DNA. And uh, what you would have done in the practical is you would have taken three tubes. Tube one, F1, contains 50 microgram per milliliter of the sperm DNA. Sperm DNA. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, another. Uh, there, there's another thing. Uh, you know what they say? Uh, don't drink water, right? Don't drink water because fish have sex in it. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm digressing. So you would have taken uh, uh, sp uh, sperm DNA. You add salt. <laughs> Fish porn, yeah. Plus cold ethanol, and I write it like that. That's ethanol, E T O H.
And what would you expect to happen if we have this scenario? 50 micrograms of uh, DNA plus salt plus ethanol. Will we be able to precipitate precipitate DNA? Will that happen? Will we make the DNA insoluble and will we get some DNA? No, no, that's not extra. That is one of the experiments that you did in the practical. So we have DNA plus salt plus ethanol. Will we get DNA from that? There's a question mark behind the yes. Well, let's just simply look at it. Can we measure DNA? In this case, we don't need any detergent because we have got already almost pure DNA sitting here. So we can measure that. We can actually take this sample and put that into our spectrophotometer. Yeah? And can you remember the absorbance where we read it? DNA? The wavelength for DNA? Yeah, 260 to 280. So let's take our F1 sample once we have precipitated the DNA and we get a reading of 0 0.83. That is after we have precipitated it. Can we calculate how what our concentration of DNA is? How can we do that? Well, we know that a concentration of 50 microgram per milliliter gives an absorbance of, what was the absorbance? If it is a standard cuvette with one centimeter part length. Absolutely right. It gives an absorbance of one. Now we get an absorbance of 0 0.893. So what would be our DNA concentration? All we need to do is we multiply it by 50 micrograms per milliliter. And we get an absorbance of, what's the absorbance for that? I think it is 44. 44.7 microgram per milliliter. Why is it one? Well, that is the standard sort of uh, 50 microgram per milliliter. Usually for DNA gives an, gives an absorbance of one. That is at 260 nanometer. That is what you measure. So for our DNA, that we have treated like that, we get 44.7 microgram per milliliter. We get that out. Does that make sense? I'll come back to that in a minute, Vernon. I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a moment. You have also taken in tube F3, you did the whole experiment without salt and, and ethanol. 
So you just simply measured the DNA sample that you had, and you got a value of 0 0.97. So the absorbance for that was 0 0.97. So the difference between F1 and F3, the difference between F3, F1 and F3 is that F1 was, we did the precipitation with salt, precipitation with salt and ethanol, and F3, no precipitation, we just simply measured the DNA concentration. And we got an absorbance of 0 0.972. So 0 0.972 times 50 microgram per milliliter. That gives us a concentration of, what is it? 48.8. 48.8. Microgram per milliliter. What? 48.6? Come back to F2 in a minute. 48.6. Whatever. Something like that. We should have had 50 micrograms per milliliter, but we lost a little bit. But it's not, it's not uh, horrible what we lost through the process of precipitation. Precipitation just simply means we make our DNA insoluble and we can easily extract it. So in the case of salt and ethanol, we do the precipitation, we make the DNA insoluble, we then put it into a form where we can measure the concentration that's in the F1. In the F3, it's, we just don't do the precipitation. We just take the DNA sample that we used and measure the concentration. So what we can do is we can calculate um, how much uh, DNA actually did we recover. So recover by precipitation all we need to do is we just divide it's either 48.6 or 48.8 i can't remember exactly what the what the number was 48.8 or 6 somebody said 6 let's put it as, as an 8 doesn't really matter. So we had 40.7 divided by 48.8, and that gives us 91, 92%. So 92% of the DNA that we used, we actually managed to precipitate. It's six. Okay, fine. It's six. With the precipitation, we uh, lose a little bit uh, because just simply because it's an additional method in it. Whereas in the F3 tube, we don't do anything with it. We just simply measure how much is there. So we get, it, it, the precipitation is really efficient. We get 92% of our DNA precipitated. And that's a really good uh, value. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, don't forget to do attendance. I'll do a five minute break for that now. And I get my numbers down here again.
Yes, please. Do attendance again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Please don't make me blush, okay? But thank you. Can I carry on? Uh, have people registered their attendance? Okay, good, great. So we have done tube F1 and F3, and we've just calculated, and please keep it's muted. Good. Please keep muted. Otherwise, Bernardo is on your case. As I said, uh, if you forgot to register, there's not a lot I can do, but, uh, you know, don't stress too much. Okay, excellent. So we've done F1 and F3, and we found that we got quite a lot of DNA back from the precipitation. So if we do the precipitation with the salt and the ethanol, we get most of the DNA that we put in, we get this precipitate. Now let's see what happens if we do the precipitation, but no salt. What happens if we don't add salt? And we have done that in the tube F2. And we uh, do the ethanol treatment, but without salt. And what you see is we get an absorbance of 0 0.013. So let's calculate the concentration of DNA. 0 0.013 times 50 microgram per milliliter. And that gives us a concentration of... Can somebody quickly do the numbers? What is 50 times 0 0.013? Zero, I trust you, 0 0.65 microgram per milliliter. Look at that. With salt, we got 44.7 microgram per milliliter. Without salt, but the same experiment, we got 0 0.65. And if we do the, the comparison, if we do 0 0.013 divided by what we should get, the 48.6, oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. 0 0.65 divided by 48.6. What that give us? 
That gives us, I think, if my calculation is correct, it gives us 1.3% only. This means without salt, we don't get any DNA. No salt, no DNA that we get. We need the salt, and we know why we need the salt. We need the salt to neutralize the charges on the DNA so that it can clump together. If we don't add the salt, like we did in this case here, we don't get any DNA clumped together precipitated. That's a fact, and we've just proven it. And what we can do now is also, let's quickly check the purity of our DNA that we add in tube F1. Let's check for the purity of the DNA that we precipitated. So why is no salt and no... Uh, no salt and no ethanol, we didn't do the precipitation. We just used the DNA. So if I just uh, draw it like that, in tube F1, we had the DNA, then we did the precipitation, and I abbreviate it like that, and we took what we got from the precipitation and measured it. In tube F3, we had our DNA in there. We didn't do any precipitation. We went straight to measure it. So in F3, we cut out the precipitation. And the alcohol does exactly the opposite. It does not dissolve the DNA because DNA is insoluble in, 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 in alcohol. It makes it insoluble, absolutely. So comparing F1 and F3, we look at the effect that the precipitation has. F3 is our sort of... Um, this is what, what we basically put in into our tube. F1 is what we put in and what we precipitated. F2 is again a precipitation, but no salt. And then we measure it. F3, we didn't need any salt for F3 because we didn't do any precipitation. We did not do any precipitation and um, therefore we also didn't do any ethanol to it. Yeah, does that make sense? So F, I would, yes, if you like, F2 and F3 are really control experiments. That's, uh, that's how I would see it. And what it basically tells us is that F1, the precipitation, works really well. We get basically 92% of our DNA. We get that back with the precipitation. Or when we do a precipitation, we get 92% of our original day DNA back. If we do the precipitation without salt, we don't get any DNA. So you need salt and ethanol to precipitate the DNA. That's absolutely correct. Are you happy with that?
fantastic. Let's have a quick look at the purity of the DNA. And we said we can measure the purity of the DNA. Purity of DNA. In a very simple way, we take a sample of DNA. Sample of DNA that's in here, either precipitated or not precipitated. It doesn't matter in this case. We can do that for F1 or F3. So let's do it for F1. That's the precipitated DNA. And we measure it at two wavelengths. We measure it at 260 nanometer, and we measure it at 280 nanometer. And for F1, we measured a value of 0 0.893 at 260 and 0 0.510 at 280 nanometers. And I told you the easiest way to find out whether a DNA sample is pure The point of that experiment was to demonstrate that the precipitation with salt is effective. The precipitation without salt doesn't work. So I told you the easiest way of dealing or checking the purity is we just simply calculate the ratio a to 60 to A to 80, our measurements. So that would be 0 0.893 divided by 0 0.510. And this is the absorbance that we measure in the spectrophotometer. We measure our DNA sample at the two different wavelengths. We just simply switch the wavelength on the spectrophotometer. What do we get for this ratio? 0 0.893 divided by uh, 0 0.51. Yeah, we get something, I think it was around 1.75. What on earth does this ratio actually tell us? What is this 1.75? 1.75, so what? Who, uh, who cares? What is 1.75? It's pure. We've got lots of DNA, yes, and it's pure. How do we know it's pure? Because I told you in a previous session that if we have something between, what was it, 1.6 to 1.9, if we get this for the ratio, if we, if we get this ratio, then the DNA is pretty poor, uh, pretty pure. So 1.75 is, you know, bang on in the middle. So our DNA sound is really nice and pure. We could do that with the DNA that we uh, isolated from kiwi fruit. Um, but I haven't done it. Does that make sense? So our fish sperm DNA after precipitation is nice, clean, and pure. Do you need to know about this experiment? Yes, absolutely. What happens if it's more than 1.9? 
If it comes back at 2.3 or higher, this indicates that there are other things in there that absorb light at the different wavelengths, which means that the DNA is most likely not pure. It is contaminated with uh, something. Why do we measure at these wavelengths? Because we said in DNA, what absorbs light at 260 nanometers? What in DNA is there that absorbs the light? No, you don't need to do a write-up in, uh, uh, in the practical books. I don't think so. What absorbs the light? in the DNA. It's the delocalized electrons. Where from? From the aromatic rings, exactly. Where do we have aromatic rings? In the bases, absolutely right. In the nucleotides, absolutely correct. So this experiment really nicely shows that, in summary, salt plus ethanol precipitation, precipitation, DNA, Pure. No salt plus ethanol precipitation, yes or yes? Do we precipitate in the absence of salt? Totally right. Precipitation. Absolutely not. It's really a, only a minor fraction of what we should get. And we know why, because we don't have the salt there that neutralizes the negative charges on the phosphate. And we don't need to even discuss whether the DNA is pure. It's probably also contaminated with other stuff. And uh, so it just simply doesn't work. And I think that is what this experiment shows quite nicely. Are you happy with that? No salt, no DNA precipitation. Absolutely right. Fantastic. Shall we do another five minute break? Well, if you don't get any DNA, really, you can't even say whether it's pure or not. You want to carry on, are you sure? Uh, the practical in the textbook, well, it is actually uh, on the website, but I can send out the link to the website again. So please have a look at it. Why do we need, why do we want to know whether the DNA is pure? Well, very often when you do any experiments with DNA, you need to have the DNA fairly pure because otherwise the experiment won't work.
Uh, I haven't set you a deadline so far. I will think about it, okay? Well, when, when there's no salt there and we try to do a, a precipitation, we won't get any DNA precipitated. That is basically what it means. We cannot do a precipitation without salt. And if you don't have any ethanol, you don't do any precipitation either, because the DNA cannot clump together. You have to have both present ethanol and salt. Otherwise, it just simply doesn't work. Yes, you can use, you can use other alcohols. So you can use ethanol or, but also very often you can use isopropanol or rubbing alcohol. And you do the pre precipitation so that you can sort of isolate the DNA and can work with the DNA. So for example, we isolated the DNA from kiwi fruit, and now we can do cool stuff with the DNA. 70% uh, is just about the limit. It better is higher proof but uh, it would work with 70%. And yes, you can use vodka, but I prefer to um, have the vodka myself. Absolutely, try it. Try it because uh, the, the household stuff, You can make a DNA cocktail, absolutely. I've never tried. I don't know what it tastes like. We still have a little bit of, it's a bit lumpier. And don't forget, it's going to be salty. So maybe would be a strawberry daikila. And soapy, yeah. Okay, let's 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 carry on, okay? Let's carry on, then you can go to your cocktails. We said we want to do some experiments with the DNA. One of the things that we want to do is, of course, we want to figure out what is the sequence of the DNA? Because we said we have a massive string of bases or base pairs in DNA. And we want to figure out what is the sequence? What is the sequence of a gene? What is the sequence of an organism? And we spent a lot of money actually to sequence the human genome sequence or to get the human genome sequence human genome sequence. 
And what this actually did was we identified every single base pair, well, most of it, every single base pair at its right position, at its correct position. We have about 3,000 million base pairs. And that was a massive undertaking. That was the Human Genome Project, exactly. And I remember I went to a talk by a guy called James Watson. Yes, it was James Watson who discovered the DNA, who was trying to get money for this human genome project before it actually uh, took off. I have to What's say, uh, hello, are you talking to me? Oh. <laughs> It was the man himself, but I have to say, I was not terribly impressed uh, with him. Uh, but hey, I can say I saw uh, James Watson. And basically, the information about the hum human genome uh, allows us to identify all the genes and allows us potentially to also look at diseases. So, how do we analyze DNA? Uh, so, Let's say we have a DNA strand that looks like five prime. We always start with five prime, A, T, G, C, 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 A, T, A, things like that. Yeah, that would be our DNA strand. And of course, we want to know which base is in which position, because that tells us what is a gene, what amino acid would be in a protein. And we can do what is called sequencing the DNA. How does sequencing actually work? Well, there have been several methods around. The method that I sort of um, started with was a chemical method. It's no longer in use. It is called the Maxim Gilbert method. And this method, uh, what it basically did was it broke the DNA according to the base. So you had a, that was a chemical, a chemical reaction. And for example, it broke the DNA strand after A's and T's. So what you needed to do is you didn't want to totally break it like that after each A or T, you didn't want to do that. What you wanted to do is you wanted to, I've destroyed my DNA now. A, T, G, C, 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 A, T, A. You want it in a sort of statistical way. So sometimes you broke it after the A. Occasionally, you broke it after the T. So you got different strand lengths. Does that make sense? So you had to play around and make sure that you don't get total breakdown. You just get 
statistical breakdown um, where you get then different strand lengths. So if you broke after the first one, after the A, you got a very short strand. If you broke after the T, you got a little bit longer strand. If you broke then after the next A, you got a longer strand. So you got different strand lengths of the DNA when you use this chemical method. Does that make sense? Nobody there? Have I lost you? Oh, okay, good. So we get different strand lengths, and all we need to do is say, all we need to figure out is how long are these strand pieces? How long are the pieces? If I know, for example, that this piece here is, let's say, one base pair, this piece here is two base pairs, this piece here is eight base pairs long, I can say that one between one and two, there must be A's, A's, then there is a stretch where there's no A's or T's, and then comes an A or T again. Let's say this is nine base pairs. And then there comes another A and T again. And the strands are not uniform because it is a random breakage. And the, 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 the fragments have a different lengths. But how can I actually? separate these DNA fragments. And Hamza already has the right idea. We can use what is called electrophoresis. Has everybody done gel electrophoresis of DNA? Some people say yes, some people say no. So how does it work? And in order to do that, I want you to think about something. Uh, I want you to imagine you are here and you want to go to here. And in between is a very busy road. That's a very busy road. So here's the start. And here's the finish. OK. Imagine there are lots and lots of people standing here. There, lots and lots of people standing here. Now, let's see Let's assume you just have a little bag. A little bag with you. And you walk along that. You can probably travel quite swiftly, right? And in a given time, you have moved pretty much towards your finish line with a little bag. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. 
So you can go quite swiftly. Now imagine you have big, big shopping bags. You might even carry a big plank with you like, you know, like, like you do, or you are, you've done lots of Christmas shopping. So it's really big. You are, you have all these parcels. How fast can you walk? Can you walk as fast as with a little bag? Can you squeeze through as easily with the little bag as with the big bags? No. So you would move slower. And the bigger it is, the slower you walk. Because there are all these people who stop you from walking. With a little bag, you are fast. With a big bag, you are very slow. And that is exactly the principle of gel electrophoresis. With DNA, we have exactly the same thing. We have a start point. And then, we, obviously, we don't have people. Instead, we have a sort of a mesh. No, a mesh, not a mesh. We have a mesh with pores in it. And this mesh is formed by a substance called agarose. It's a very complex sugar with long chains. And you see, you've got pores here. But these pores are pretty much the same thing as we have with people here. It's the distance between the people. You can imagine these agarose bits being the people. And uh, the pores is the space between them. So, how do we get DNA actually to move? Well, that's not terribly difficult because we know that DNA is charged. DNA is, what is the charge of DNA? It's negative. So all we need is an electric field and where we have negative side here, negative field here and a positive field on that side. So the DNA that is negatively charged will move into this direction. It will move towards the positive side. And if I choose the pore size right, then it will separate the small strands from the big strands. The small strands will move fast. Small fragments move fast. How do you control the pore size? That's very good. This is controlled by the concentration of the agarose that you use. Concentration of the agarose. The higher the concentration, the denser, the smaller the pores. The lower the concentration, the bigger the pores, the less people you have. Does that make sense? So small fragments travel very fast. Big fragments are slow because they are, you know, they bump into people. No, sorry, the agarose. And they travel very, very slowly. So these are the big fragments. And because this is based on an electric field, this procedure is called electro.
and the electric current here carries the DNA, which in Greek means phoros. So the procedure is called electrophoresis. And we have an electric field, so we have from negative to positive, and our DNA always moves into the positive direction to, to get there. The agarose is just simply there to stop the DNA from just running along. It is like the people in the uh, above uh, example. Uh, the DNA has to move through it, and it slows down the, the, the DNA. And so what we can do is we can now have a DNA gel. The agarose forms a gel. So we have a DNA gel. And according to the size of the DNA, so we have our starting point here. Our positive is here. So we can have DNA fragments sorted by size. So let's have a look. Let's compare this fragment with this fragment here. Which fragment has traveled further? Which fragment has traveled faster? The red or the blue one? The blue one, exactly. The blue one has almost reached the destination. So this is a small fragment. Whereas this is a large fragment. Do you see the difference? So the blue one has almost reached the destination, which means it's small. The large one is still sitting there trying to get through the, 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 the gel. And uh, because it's so big, it travels much slower than the blue one, which is really agile and can whiz through. And it turns out that uh, distance traveled distance traveled, and we just simply can measure that. If we know where the start is, we just simply measure the distance from the start to here, our fragment, and say that's a long distance. So distance traveled is in a relationship with the fragment size. The further traveled, the smaller the fragment. Does that make sense? But it actually turns out that it's not that simple. It's not a linear relationship. Not linear. Instead, it turns out that we need to look at the log of the to the base 10 of the size of the fragment. to the distance, to the migration, to the distance. So it's not directly size fragment versus distance that we can plot. It is 
log 10, the logarithm of the size fragment versus the distance. And that's something that's quite important. And we will discuss that in uh, one of the other modules uh, when we do uh, sort of a little bit of statistics. So for the time being, let's keep in mind that we are looking at the logarithm of the size fragment versus distance, how we plot that. And it's the logarithm, not simply the size fragment. But how can we then actually see DNA in this gel? How can we make DNA visible in the gel? Our DNA is soluble at that point. So we would not necessarily easily see it. Well, we can label DNA. Or, as some people say, we can use dyes to make DNA uh, visible. One of the dyes is, let me see if I can find that. Uh, where am I? I need to go to this one here. Oh yes, that's a cool dye. This dye is called Ethidium bromide. It has this structure. You don't need to learn this structure, but what you see in this structure is that there are lots of aromatic rings. lots of aromatic rings in there. And what actually happens is that when you use this dye, it will slip into a double helix strand. So here you have your base pairs, nice base pairs. You have here your DNA. 5 prime, 3 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime. That's your DNA strand here with the bases. And this ethidium bromide can slip in here. It's also planar or almost planar. That's this ethidium bromide. And when it is in contact with the DNA bases like that here, and you send UV light onto it, it gives it a really reddish, eerie glow. So when you use this ethidium bromide, it intercalates into the DNA, it interacts the electrons in this ring system in ethidium bromide actually interact with the DNA bases and you can actually see DNA with the help of this ethidium bromide. Of course you need to know it. You are going to be a scientist. The problem is that when you have ethidium bromide there and you read your DNA, ethidium bromide is seen as a base. So whenever you do, for example, transcription, the reaction will see ethidium bromide as an additional base. So you've added something which wasn't there before and it makes it read wrong exactly. Another thing that you can do is you can radio label. You can radio label DNA.
And you can add a radioactive, radioactive substance. You can include that into DNA. And what we've done, uh, or what, what I showed you, is that you can have your DNA. So you have your base, you have an OH group. And when you add another trinucleotide, PPP, C, then with an enzyme, the enzyme will cleave the new nucleotide or the trinucleotide. This part here will move away and we make this connection, this one here. So we end up with base O and we have this P here, this P here. This is actually the alpha P. This would be the beta P and this would be the gamma P, gamma phosphate. So here we have got the phosphate, this dark one which is attached to the other nucleotide. And if you make this phosphate, for example, radioactive, then your DNA will become radioactive. The whole DNA will be radioactive. And radioactivity is something that you can very easily detect. All you need to do for radioactivity to detect is um, an X-ray film. So you can produce different size fragments on your gel. And if they are radioactively labeled, if these things are radioactively labeled, you can fix them in the gel and you just simply add an X-ray film and you see this radioactive pattern. I know I'm not an artist. And I fully accept that. So this is how we can make DNA visible. We can use other uh, dyes. So I showed you ethidium bromide, ethidium bromide, which is highly carcinogenic, carcinogenic because it intercalates in the DNA. I've worked many, many years with ethidium bromide. So I'm sure I have picked up quite a few mutations. So I would be surprised if I live longer than, say, 70 or something like that, because all these mutations that I probably picked up uh, will lead to cancer. We can use other dyes that have been recently developed, which are much safer, which are fluorescent dyes, for example, cyber green. This is a green fluorescent dye, which is much safer. Um, or we can label, uh, radio label DNA. This is really all I wanted to do for today. We have done a lot. We've covered a lot of grounds. I'm sorry that we had to do it, but I thought, I hope it was moderately uh, interesting. So these are the ways that we can locate DNA in agarose gel. And uh, usually we now would use something like cyber green. We just let the DNA move. 
and then treat it with this fluorescent dye and check out where are the bands located. Does that make sense? Well, in this case, thank you very much for watching. We have another BI300 lecture tomorrow where I told you that I will, uh, I will disclose to you that the genetic code is not universal and I will tell you how I got stung by it. So I hope to see you tomorrow afternoon, the first one for BI308 and then the second one for BI300. Have a lovely evening. Enjoy your evening and be good and don't do anything I wouldn't do. Uh, but, you know, maybe you want to try out the Kiwi cocktail. Take care. Bye bye.